Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, uh, we're here together to discuss challenges, impact and opportunities, global anti-gender mobilizing. Um, Kate is happy to organize this webinar in partnership with the International Trans Fund, ILGA World and Outright. We're gonna have an ama amazing speakers who are gonna share different perspectives and different information from us for, with us today. Uh, this is a series of webinars. Um, today is the first webinar. And in a couple of days on the 28th, we're gonna have another webinar who's gonna, uh, that's gonna be looking at regional perspectives. And we're gonna prepare a report from the discussions on both webinars. Um, that you all be able, we will share with everyone who attended um, the webinars. Please be reminded that there is a question and answer button. If you have questions for any of our panelists today, kindly indicate to which panelists you want to address the question to, if it's specific to one panelist, and we're gonna forward the question to the panelists. Uh, uh, thank you once more for joining us today, and I take the pleasure to introduce our first panelist, uh, Vivian. Welcome, um, and thank you for joining us today. Vivian is a transfeminist activist, researcher, and economist based in Brazil, currently focused on trans communities and data production related to trans issues and working as program officer at the International Trans Fund. Um, uh, Vivian, when looking at the work and funding applications of national and gender diverse organizations, um, which the ITF is funding, what are some of the most recent and pressing issues and challenges that the global trans gender diverse groups are, are facing in regards to anti-gender mobilizing. Thank you so much, Erica. And it's great to see you, Luisa, Chamindra, everyone who's here attending as well. Like um, I send you uh, uh, my greetings, right? Like hope you're doing well. Uh, about your question, Erica, and thank you for that. Um, I would say that in general, uh, there's a overwhelming need for sustainable resourcing, not only project oriented, but also for projects that group are, are uh, engaging with, because there's basically insufficient funds for trans-led movements overall, trans and gender diverse movements, right? Uh, many groups that apply or receive our grants, our ITF grants, uh, have, the, have these grants or this application, our fund as one of the few funding possibilities. So this is one major concern for us. Uh, but specifically in relation to anti-gender mobilization, I would say that many groups are facing more difficulties to access institutional resources because of how, how this politics unfolds which is related to right-wing politics rising across the globe as well. Um, we receive a lot of um, information on energy, well-being, like critical situations for trans groups as well, being affected by these politics. So especially for those that are directly engaged in resisting anti-gender politics and some groups, especially when, like, because of their activities and focus of work, they're also particularly threatened by, it. like, besides being trans and gender diverse, if, if they work on sex work, if they work uh, with uh, about childhood, adolescence, for instance, they will face more challenges in accessing funds, doing their work, etc. I would say that, yeah, from our ITF experience, these are some highlights for us at this point. Thank you, Vivan, and thank you for sharing and highlighting the importance of addressing issues of well-being, particularly to persons who are in the front line dealing with all these issues, with attacks and all the hatred and stress that it causes our communities and our organizations. 
uh, and thank you for the ITF for its amazing work and for the opportunity to fund groups from all over the world. Can you share a little bit about what are the new opportunities as well as innovative ideas that TGD uh, groups uh, are deploying in response to these issues? Sure, yeah. Uh, we've seen, we've been witnessing like amazing imagination, resistance, resilience from trans led movements, right? Like in many places. I, I thought about the question before, and like I, I was thinking about highlighting some specific items, right? I think the first one would be about cross movement collaborations and alliances. We see some grantee partners, some applicants really engaging with LGB, feminists, other social justice organizations. Uh, also, collaborations and alliances with academia and other institutions. Like, we have one grantee partner like in the Caribbean who engaged with the Ministry of Health of their country to elaborate a national trans health strategy. So these kind of alliances are also present in the work we do and in funding, in the funding work we see, right? Uh, also, I would like to highlight the intersectional approach to trans issues. This is part of our principle as a fund as well. And we see that like trans-led movements doing work in prisons with, within racialized communities, uh, including global North contexts. So working with immigration issues, uh, we see some groups centering on the pressing needs of the population, but also developing imaginaries. So from art, memories, uh, thinking about futures, like investing in our futures as a, as a movement and as communities, right? And we also see some groups doing work regarding childhood and adolescence, which deals with these delicate, complicated borders I, I mentioned before, right? In regarding anti-gender politics. And I also wanted to mention that the many groups working in what we would say like more traditional activism, they are also constantly adapting and strategizing. And especially because of changes in political context, because of anti-gender politics as well, like some groups that we would say, oh, they do more traditional activism. They're also presenting dynamics to that work. That, Thank you, Vivian. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so important and it's, you know, I, I, everywhere I look or wherever I speak with trans communities, I hear the word resiliency. And, you know, it's, it's a word that I have a little bit of, you know, antagonism against, just because I shouldn't have to be resilient to be able to survive and to be respected and, and to enjoy my human rights. But I am so glad we are all working to this, the importance of cross-movement collaboration that you mentioned. And, and I will come back to you around those flexibilities that you mentioned, because it, I think it's really important for us to hear more about them. But I'm gonna go and move to our next speakers for the moment. Um, uh, we're gonna uh, invite Luisa. Luisa is Outright's uh, United Nations Program Officer based in New York. She's a Brazilian attorney with an international human rights law, uh, LLM from the University of Essex. She is an organizing partner of the LGBTI stakeholder group and has trained more than 100 activists and government officials on international and regional non-discrimination standards with an emphasis on LGBT rights. Luisa, welcome and thank you for joining us today and thank you for outright uh, for accepting the invitation. Uh, can, you, can you share with us a little bit about the new trends, uh, challenges posed and tactics used by anti-gender groups against advocating for the inclusion of trans and gender diverse people in the UN's development agenda? Of course, first of all, thank you so much for, Gate, for having me here today. It is great to be here. 
for anyone who is watching us right now and doesn't know Outright, I would invite you to go to our website and get to know a little bit about Outright. We're a global LGBTIQ organization that focuses on advocacy, research, and movement building. Um, and my work specifically is at the UN space. As, and as it was mentioned, I'm one of the organizing partners of the LGBTI stakeholder group. And I wanna start with that before I go through the all different spaces because I have a very special space in my heart for the LGBTI stakeholder group because it's the only LGBTI group of civil society that is recognized through the special procedures within the UN. So because the Rio 92 conference recognize the participation of major groups and other stakeholders, the LGBTI stakeholder group is officially recognized by the UN. And it's the only LGBTI group within the UN space that has official documents that are publicized by UN DESA. So I like to bring that up and also invite everyone who is interested in this space to look out for the group or to send me an email and I'm more than happy to include you on our mailing list. But I wanna give an overview on comparison between what we do in human rights spaces and New York and development. I'm gonna be focusing on the development part, but I think it's important to do this quick comparison because when we talk about New York UN spaces, we talk about, for instance, the commission and the set of the women, and we see a lot of what happens on attacks to trans and gender diverse people, what happens as attacks to LGBTI folks uh, using the triad uh, life family nation to attack us and our rights and everything that happens and how important it is that the LGBTI movement works together with the feminist movement to occupy the spaces. When we move towards a little bit more to the development space, it's very interesting because there's less of a focus on gender. So there's more of a flexibility for us to also act. It's harder because it's somewhere that we're not so present, but it's also more interesting to me as a human being, but it's not more interesting than human rights because there are more flexibility and there are different groups. So if you think about CSW that you have a very human rights focused and you move towards, for instance, the commission on population and development, you still see the same kind of pushback for people saying the family as if there is only one kind of family. We still see the push for sovereignty, like those things don't happen in our countries. Um, we don't have LGBTI populations in our country, which is blank, blank, fake news. And when we move to other spaces, for instance, the Generation Equality Forum that was created for uh, moving forward the SDGs when it comes to gender equality, we see that there was still a push because we have the usage of gender, we have the usage of gender-based violence, but we already have a shift, right? So we're not talking about violence against women, we're talking about gender-based violence. Uh, we have more inclusion of groups and trans inclusionary groups and non-diverse groups and intersex groups present, but we also know that it's not ideal. When we move to the specific implementation of the SDGs and we talk specifically about the high level political forum for sustainable development and the expert groups, it's a space that is so diverse that a lot of the issues that we find are not necessarily the anti-gender groups, we find member states. There are pushing the anti-gender agenda, but we don't see as much of civil society. So this is also a space that I invite our colleagues here to occupy with us, because I think it's a very good space that people are not talking necessarily about sexual orientation, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics because they're against it, but because they don't understand it. So for me, one of the very beautiful things that we did in this space is that we worked together with 20 other constitutions from farmers to businesses to the women's caucus and, and all of that. And last year, one of the groups that was having an event about access to water um, for people who are discriminated by work and descent called us and was like, we would really like to have an LGBTI person and specifically a trans person in our event because we think we don't know so much about this and we need to have someone who does and we need to have more of those conversations. So I think that this is also, there is of course, we will hear members say saying, we will never talk about LGBTI. We will hear uh, certain groups saying that, but in the development space, because it's so diverse and it's so unexpected that we are present there, that we see a lot less pushback. And I think it is an opportunity for us as a movement to occupy the space so much 
that when the anti-gender movement does understand how much we occupy everything and we're not just about violence, we're also about access to water. We're also about living our lives and education and work that when they do realize that we've already occupied that entire space. And I think that that is very important. Thank you very much. I, I'm smiling when you're mentioning that because sometimes, you know, uh, as, as community or as a group, we tend to bring down ourselves to a little corner of the work and, or a very specific work around the SDGs. And we forget that we live in the real world and everything around us affects us and we relate it to everything and we need to have influence and a voice in everything that affects our lives and, and our families and the communities we live in. So thank you. And thank you for all the work you do in that space. Um, you mentioned a little, you know, uh, Vivian mentioned about well-being, but you also mentioned the harsh uh, work and, you know, all the, you, you know, the attacks or, or, or the barriers that you face in the work. What does Luisa do to address well-being after coming from a UN session for a whole week where people are constantly attacking the work you do and what you say? Um, I think one of the most important things that Luisa does, but I think everyone in our movement does, is finding your people and finding your movement um, and seeing how you get embraced and embrace everyone. And I think that that is very important. Um, and seeing more and more feminist spaces and groups that are that call themselves feminist actually embracing also our movements and embracing all of our siblings who are part of this movement and coming together to try to get the best that we can. And I really like uh, what Vivian said about developing futures and envisioning a new world. And I think that that also is what does the wellness for us, because if we can envision it, then we can get it. And I think that that's the most important part of it. And I see a difference on the feminist movement in the development space from two years ago to today, just because we have been there and we've been having these conversations. Um, and for instance, something that I invite also everyone to watch is the series of the women's major group on Until All of Us Are Free, None of Us Are Free and how they created a space for people to start talking within their feminist movement about sex work, about trans rights, about um, racial minorities, talking about religious minorities and so on. And I think that that is so important and that is what makes our movement so vibrant and having those conversations and feeling part of a group is what makes us able to stop and rest and think and dream about a better future. Thank you. And you know, you mentioned something really important that sometimes many of us don't realize that in some spaces, like in the spaces you work, it's uh, many times the member states doing the push, uh, anti-gender push. How those outright, and I also, if, if ITF and, and GATE and, and, um, uh, and ILGA want to chip in, please do so. How does you, Luisa, and outright work around that when member states are pushing the anti-gender agenda? I think that there's two different tactics. There's one tactic, which is talking to our champions. So within the, the New York UN space, we have the UN LGBTI core group, which is a group of 39 missions that are here in New York City that are pushing LGBTI rights throughout the UN and we work with them and they are our champions. But also when we're talking about something um, like a voting, like a resolution, like a space, also having that conversation with the moving parts, with the middle ground, right? So I know I'm referencing a lot of things that I'm more than happy to share with people all the websites and links, uh, but the, the UN team at Outright, we launched in the beginning of this year, a Q&A on the elections resolution that came out last year at the UN General Assembly, which is the second ever resolution to come out with sexual orientation and gender identity in the General Assembly. And we do exactly an analysis of that on what kind of discourses those are against, including it would say, which are false discourses of culture and sovereignty and so on as if sexual orientation and gender identity is not protected by international law, but it is. And also how the groups that were in favor 
mobilize for them to not only come out with this resolution, but also to have this conversation with those that were in the middle, because I think that that's what we have to move. I don't think that anti-right states are going to change their minds tomorrow, but I do think that there are a middle moving part that will change their minds and things will improve. And it's important to work with that. And I'm more than happy to share that analysis as well that the outright did. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and bef uh, one last question for you. Uh, can, can you share a little bit in that environment? Uh, what are the new opportunities and innovative ideas that you are seeing? Um, I think that a lot of the innovative ideas that I see come from creating those spaces with other groups. So working with youth activists, um, working with different regions and learning what's happening in these spaces. And I, and I tell this to everyone, and this is gonna be on video again, that my job wouldn't exist if there were not people doing grassroots work on the ground. And what we do at our UN program is also elevate the realities that are happening on the ground and use our expertise, because we know that the UN can be very tricky and complicated and use very specific language. But we think it's so important to work together and bring all those voices to these spaces. And I think that that's the most innovative thing because everyone is already doing so much work and so many important work on the ground that it is super important to highlight that and to create those spaces. That's why, you know, Outright has uh, the, is one of the organizing partners of the LGBTI stakeholder group. We are the convener of the LBTI caucus that organizes in the space of the Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, we, and hopefully we'll have it again now that COVID is gone, had our advocacy week to bring people together and to share that knowledge. And we also have our fellowships uh, that are programs specifically to train advocates that are doing work in the comparison of, well, together with religion and LGBTI rights to learn how to use these mechanisms. Because the more of us that know how to use these mechanisms, the more we can occupy this space, the more we can talk about our issues. Thank you. You are so um, right, Lisa. We need to share this information and the more of us that are involved and that learn how to use the tools, we will be more effective. Uh, uh, so thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move to our next speaker. Um, Chamindra works in the gender identity expression and sex characteristics program at ILGA World uh, with the trans uh, human rights portfolio. She's a human rights defender with an intersectional feminist focus and a published author in the area of intersectional feminist international relations. Chamindra, thank you for being with us today and taking time to share uh, with us and our viewers. Um, what, from your work at ILGA and your work as an activist, um, what are the new trends and challenges, uh, the tactics that you see the anti-gender groups are using and, uh, and, and how is it um, impacting the international human rights framework? Mm, thank you, Erica. Thank you, for, thank you to Gates for having me in this space. It's a pleasure to be here. So in terms of um, tactics uh, and that, Erica, one thing we notice is that, um, you know, the, it's, there is a very monotonous pattern, pattern in these things because um, uh, very often we see a lot of divide and rule tactics, um, routine dehumanizing of people um, and calls for conformity, right? So all of these, uh, propaganda movements as such. I don't like to call those movements these propagandist trends. Um, they are at the end of the day uh, focused on ensuring conformity to a certain cisnormative, heteronormative ideal. So we see that also in the Geneva UN spaces um, every now and then when there is uh, an event of specific uh, Sojiesque focus happening, 
uh, you could see certain individuals, certain groups coming to disrupt those proceedings. We noticed those during the COVID pandemic, during public consultations of um, uh, certain uh, special procedures mandate holders, for example, the independent expert on uh, SOGI, i.e. SOGI as uh, independent expert on uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so some of those uh, platforms being uh, interrupted, disrupted, and so on. And um, however, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at it um, in a kind of a longitudinal way, you notice that these things have existed for a long time. And um, on, in, in terms of, um, in terms of opportunity, what we see is that um, there are, efforts to address these issues in a consistent way, like for example, uh, IESOG's report on gender, right? Uh, power over rights um, and, um, uh, and, and so um, one, one uh, section of the report, which was launched in Geneva, the other one in New York. Uh, so there is work being done to um, address uh, the importance of uh, looking at um, uh, looking at uh, like SOGI-esque human rights in a more inclusive kind of holistic way, which is what we are trying to do. And um, also in our work, we try to, um, in our engagements with um, trans human rights collectives worldwide, we tr uh, try to, of course, as colleagues have already mentioned, we try to focus on, um, on, on the, body of work that involves looking after our communities, um, be it trans human rights work, intersex human rights work, or um, uh, any other aspect of, uh, you know, our, our uh, partnerships, you know, uh, with the Ilga regions and that. Um, and also um, to focus on, you know, the well-being of our, our communities. And um, also one thing that we uh, frequently highlight is also the precedence of uh, trans and gender diverse people uh, working uh, closely in partnership with um, uh, rights movements, especially intersectional feminist uh, movements in, in different parts of the world, like in the North American black feminist tradition, for example, um, trans and gender diverse people have always had a center space in, in those spaces. So, um, uh, we try to draw from those inclusive movements and try to see how we can extend the table. Uh, and, and that's where we stand, um, you know, in our international human rights engagements, um, trying to create more inclusive spaces um, uh, internationally and figuring out ways in which we take better care of our communities um, uh, at, um, at more local level. Thank you, Chamindra. And, and it's, uh, you know, taking care of the communities we serve, addressing uh, the needs that arise uh, in response to different situations and stressors that uh, our communities affront, but also making sure that the work continues and it's innovative and it's responsive to the current reality. All this work requires a lot of resources. And needless to say, human resources, financial resources. How do we go about, you know, with this boost of anti-gender movement from one side that is well-financed and extremely organized, how do our movements cope? And, you know, with that situation and how can we address and close the gap in the financial and human resources and technical assistance needed to uh, do a better job in serving our communities and the movement in this topic. Oh, that is indeed um, a quite a challenging question, Erica. So I guess it's a one step at a time kind of scenario. Um, so uh, how it's also, um, exemplary of how power imbalances work in this world, right? Um, be it like you, you take any form of power imbalance, the gender pay gap um, in the professional spaces, gender pay gap in sport or, or uh, gender-based discrimination of any, any, any sort, uh, mm -hmm. the more powerful parties would be 
uh, financially uh, better equipped. You know, the, those that call for conformity um, would be um, uh, a bit stronger on that front. So what we do is, uh, what we all do, um, uh, mobilization to strengthen our position in terms of the uh, project funding um, and also in terms of the overall body of work that we produce. Now, um, I hope that um, quite a few of you um, uh, at this event and also our guests uh, watching uh, are likely to attend the ILGA World Conference, the World Conference that's happening in a week's time in Tongva land. Um, uh, otherwise also known as Los Angeles um, on the west coast um, of Turtle Island. Uh, and uh, at, at that conference, we will be hosting uh, quite a few events that are focused on, um, on, on uh, strengthening transhuman rights work and addressing challenges to transhuman rights work, uh, the re addressing reactionary challenges to transhuman rights work. Right, and um, uh, so one key uh, support network that we work with um, is with the Free to Be Me Strategic Partnership, um, which is funded by the Royal Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, so that body of work at Ilga World is led by Dennis Van Van Rooy, uh, um, the program manager of our GS team. Uh, shout out to Dennis for all their great work on the. Um, uh, anti-trans human rights propagandist work or the backlash uh, on the work that focuses on backlash uh, against trans human rights. And um, we've organized uh, several spaces where we will be um, in particular focused on, um, on, on uh, engaging with our communities, you know, having interactive dialogues, workshops on, uh, on how these issues manifest in different parts of the world and um, how we can build solidarity across the board. Um, uh, and, and also as uh, uh, Louisa mentioned there, the fact that um, uh, the fact that when you say when you say trans human rights, it's a body, we're talking about a body of human rights that uh, extend to so many sectors, you know, and and um, uh, to, to raise those um, um, uh, today's that kind of a you know a diversity of issues um so what we do is also partly there is a research focus there is a community building focus and also there is a uh, a focus on creating platforms for for dialogue uh, solidarity building and uh, movement building against all forms of um, backlash uh, that target our inclusive and holistic human rights advocacy work. So um, I guess um, that's um, an answer to the question, uh, Erika, over to you. Thank you very much, Jamindra, and thank you also to ILGA World for the work they're doing in supporting this work. And, and definitely uh, there's a lot of need and unmet uh, needs in regards to resources. Uh, to continue this work and address these issues. Uh, uh, um, I'm going to introduce Levan. Uh, Levan is a, a, our gender movement program officer at GATE. Uh, they are human rights and social justice activists with over 10 years of experience at national and international levels. And they will be leading Gates' work on anti-gender opposition and our work uh, in human rights and UN spaces. So Levan, thank you and, and thank, um, thank you for joining us and thank you for agreeing to work with Gates and being on the panel today. Um, I, I want to ask one question to everyone and I'm gonna start with you, Levan, and I'm putting you on the spot. So apologies for that, but I want all of you to imagine you have a donor right now that tells you, I have tons of money. I don't know how to spend it or where to spend it. And you need to change their mind and convince them that they need to fund this area of work to address the backlash in human rights issues for trans people. What would you tell them? Short and sweet. And I'm going to start with Levan. Hmm. Well, first of all, thank you, Erica, for having me. Um, yeah, that's um, hmm, that's an interesting question. Like, first of all, I would definitely tell them about the existing 
um, evidence that um, a lot of feminists and queer and trans activists have been uh, voicing um, about the latest trends that um, are happening around the world. These movements are growing very fast. They have been able to show their um, power in rolling back some of the most hard won gains that trans and gender diverse groups have been fighting for and also other supportive and um, allied movements and emancipatory movements, um, including women's movement, for example, right? Um, and if we're not, if we will not address this issue soon, this is going to undermine all the advancements that we have had. And it's, it might start with trans and gender diverse and the most marginalized communities, but it, the eventual goal of these movements is anti-democracy. So this, was, this will hurt all of us. And unless we do something about it, this is going to, the world is going to become much more scarier than it is right now. Thank you, Levan. And donors who are listening to this, please take notes and make sure you put the money where it should go. Um, so, so thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to ask Luisa. And Luisa, before you respond, I want to remind our listeners that you can use the Q&A box to submit questions. You can submit general questions for everyone. Or if you want to submit it to a specific panelist, please uh, write who you want your question to be directed to. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this. Luisa, please. Well, I didn't change your finger for my pitch, but I do think that an important point that we all should be talking about when we're talking with donors is that the anti-gender movement is an anti-democratic movement, is an anti-rule of law movement, is an anti-rights movement. So if we don't finance and combat this, and this is a movement, the anti-rights and anti-gender movement that is so well financed, and if we don't finance those who are pro-rights, pro-gender, pro-democracy, then attacking LGBTI and trans and gender non-diverse people, sexual reproductive health and rights is just the first step of many steps. And we see that throughout the world on the campaigns of politicians, and we see it throughout the world on campaign on religious leaders that are against rights, uh, exactly using LGBTI people and specifically trans and gender diverse people as a scapegoat. And this is just the first step. And this is a, a way to enter the anti-democracy and an attack to everything else and to attack all the rights that we already fought for. So this is just the first entry point, as we, we like to say in, in certain space, that's just like the point of the sphere that's going to like kick everything else, like a domino effect. So it's so important to start tackling this now, because later on, it's going to be more and more attacks to more and more rights and democracy itself. So I think that is why it's so important to finance and work within this movement. Thank you. I think if any donor has any doubts in developing their next work plan, they should contact this group. Uh, Vivian, can you share, what would you tell them? Yeah, much has been said by Liva and Lisa uh, already and Chamindra as well. Like, um, I think, um, yeah, seeing, how can I say, like the, the unfairness in how our movements are resisting, like uh, doing great work, as Livan said, a lot of power, like uh, many sim symbols of hard won struggles uh, coexisting with a comprehensive lack of resources. So this is a very unfair situation. It's not about just funding one or another thing. It's about uh, having a well-financed, well-funded, um, anti-rights, anti-rule of law uh, uh, perspectives. So yeah, funding these is about this. And I believe that there's many organizations, many actors, many stakeholders in these struggles that are able to provide expertise uh, and ideas on how to best fund those groups, those grassroots work that enable institutional advocacy, for instance, and other like sorts of move, other uh, institutional level movements that need resources 
for us to do like institutional advocacy better. So, and acknowledging that the re out, doing outreach to many groups is such a, a, a difficult task for many organizations, for, for many funders and grants, uh, grant uh, donors. Uh, relying on intermediaries, relying on partners for, for, for these allocation of resources could be another alternative. I think that the ITF in its philanthropic advocacy tries to make this point. Uh, do, not, do not see the obstacles as like uh, unsurmountable. Like we are doing within our very limited capacities, we are already doing that. And we have, we've been seeing like the brilliance and power of our movements already. So I guess my, my pitch would be along these lines. Thank you, Vivian. And definitely, I think it's time to recognize the expertise within the community and valued. With, it needs to be valued. Chamindra, uh, can you let us know how, what you would tell a donor um, to let them know how important it is to finance this area of work. Um, thank you, Erica. So one thing I would say is, I um, mean, what's already been um, said here that uh, these anti-gender movements, they are in fact uh, anti-human rights, anti-democratic uh, movements. So in the world we live in today, um, there is a big anti-democratic backlash, right? That's taking place. You take any country um, from, the likes of Brazil to India and beyond. Um, Anti-democratic, uh, anti-minority uh, backlashes that are happening uh, across the board. And um, the best way to understand transnational anti-gender activity is in that context, you know. So uh, the rise of a very reactionary um, uh, set of ideas that are um, that, that are very oppressive towards minorities. So and also that the fact that these um, these movements are you know conservative very regressive and reactionary so um, what we want to advocate for is for the promotion of human rights promotion of democracy promotion of good governance promotion of uh, 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 constructive cooperation international cooperation and 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 development uh, uh, of our communities you know uh, sgds and a focus on sgds and uh, focus on sustainability uh, at all levels so that's the uh, set of uh, that's the basic context that's how i would develop the context for a donor on 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 these issues and highlight that uh, people advocating for um, uh, cross-community consensus, people advocating for um, inclusive um, advocacy work uh, that, you know, that centers um, people from, you know, marginal backgrounds and um, strength, send, that works to um, work that uh, strengthens intersectional feminist um, discourses on, on, um, uh, on uh, human rights advocacy. For example, that's the that's where uh, the fo focus of donors should be. Uh, where if if um, uh, if um, they are good, if the contributions of donors are to be uh, maximized, so that would be my uh, the, the kind of language, the kind of approach that I would use, which has all already been you know highlighted by colleagues here. Over to you, Erica. Thank you, Chamindra. Um, um, thank you very much uh, for, for our listeners who are posting questions and comments in the chat. We're going to post uh, emails that you can contact us also at the websites of the different organizations involved today. Um, I, I see some great suggestions for collaboration, for continued conversations. So I'm, we're going to leave an email there so you can communicate with us. Um, questions uh, are from from the floor and anyone who wants to answer please go ahead uh, some organizations and corporations have a big investment in diversity equity inclusion and belonging what is the best way for a corporation to fight back challenge and speak out against the anti-gender movement Luisa, you want to give it a try? Um, sure. Um, I don't. I don't usually use the best way because there's not a one size fits all depending on the 
size of a company and, and so on. I think it's it's important to put your money and your actions where your mouth is. So it's very important if any kind of organization or business is saying we support LGBTIQ rights, that they are financing organizations that are doing this, that they have internal policies that protect those who are part of the community that are within that business, that they're partnering up with organizations who have the expertise. So they're not just creating random policies or doing something without any kind of consultation and understanding. Um, and most of all, trying to understand the intersectional realities that exist by having those conversations, by asking the questions on who can I partner with, who can assist us with the organizations that we're doing, can you recommend us someone from the community to talk to us, uh, pay the people who are doing this kind of work, because a lot of the times uh, it's assumed that people who are doing this kind of training and work is doing your voluntary work and it's not voluntary work. So I think it's put your money and your policies where your mouth is would be uh, the main rule. Thank you very much. Anybody wants to add anything? Yeah, I would like to add. So I think corporations um, or like private entities in general need to be, first of all, as Luisa said, have to have their own, or own internal policies, but also like they need to take up, they need to engage in more um, corporate responsibility, which means that they need to understand and also critically analyze where they get money from and whether that type of business contributes to inequalities in general, because there's a lot of feminist academic theories and also beyond feminist academic um, thinking that this neoliberal system, which perpetuates inequalities is a huge contributor to an environment where this anti-gender movements thrive. So they need to be cautious of that and they need to critically understand the way they work and whether they're supporting that those kind of inequalities through their work, but also as donors or like, or like as groups who are funding certain movements, I think, and it's also, it's, um, I think it's true to all types of donors, including corporations, they need to understand that these type of work takes a lot of time and they need to give out more flexible grants and also fund the fund the groups that are most vulnerable because those are the groups that take most um they face most violence and those are the groups are, which are best equipped to um address those um attacks so in and it need those are and usually those are the groups that get the least funding so i would encourage any donor, including corporations, to invest in the most marginalized communities and you remove the barriers barriers that um, serve to keep these groups away from um, receiving funding. Thank you, Levan, and thank you, Luisa. I want to uh, move on to a question about what are your organizations doing to support the work and what can we expect from the fund uh, uh, from the fund, from ILGA, uh, from Outra in the near future. So what are you doing ITF, uh, Outright and ILGA world? And what can we expect in the near future? I think I can go first. Uh, and thanks for this question, Erika. Um, yeah, from the ITF side, like we provide flexible grants. So this is one thing that we totally agree with Levan's perspective, like the need for removing barriers enables us to fund groups that are not registered, for instance. This is a big thing for trans politics in general, right? Many trans-led groups cannot be registered. So is your diversity, equity, inclusion politics, like is, is this uh, allowing you to fund uh, the most marginalized groups? So this is one thing to analyze and from the ITF point, like we try to do this from providing flexible grants. Uh, we're also thinking about sustainability. So within our limited resources, we try to provide two tires, like of grants that are smaller, like grants that are larger for some groups that we already developed a relationship with. Uh, one thing we're, we're really like, advocate for 
within philanthropy is about participatory grant making. So uh, uh, trans people, trans activists, trans professionals being part of the selection of grantee partners, being part of our board as well. This is so important. And I think any policy from an organization focused on LGBTI or trans like uh, issues need to pay, pay attention to that and expectations for uh, the future, right? Like uh, we expect to have more funds. This is one thing to, to provide to trans groups. Currently we provide about 10% of all the application, eligible applications we receive. We are able to resource only this fraction of what we receive as uh, from trans led groups. Uh, we also recently incorporated as an entity. So we're also having like a, a new stage in our work. And we hope to keep um, working to develop capacity building. This links to something Luisa mentioned, like how group trans led movements can be, uh, can see institutional UN level advocacy as what part of their strategy. This is far, this is further for some groups, this is closer to their reality for others. And we hope that more and more trans led groups are able to be part of these environments. Um, also, we try to be open uh, in terms of uh, providing information on the application process, making it simple. This is, these are elements that we hope to always improve as we move along. Over to you, Anita. Thank you, Vivian, uh, and congratulations to the ITF. Um, huge congratulations. I'm, we're sure it's just going to grow bigger and bigger because there is the need and it's relevant. So count on all of our support uh, to continue working and supporting the work of the ITF and promoting all you do. Um, Luisa. Yeah, I was trying to write down a little bit of everything that we're doing. People tend to think outright it's a lot bigger in staff than we are because of the amount of things that we always try to do. Um, just a tease of a lot of things that we have been doing. Uh, we currently have our fund for Ukraine, where we're passing micro grants to organizations that are working with LGBTIQ populations in Ukraine and around Ukraine right now. Uh, we have a program that is coming out this year that just closes applications that's called LVQ Connect, which is a mentorship program that we're very excited for. Um, at the UN space, we continue to follow everything that happens in New York and invite everyone who is willing and able to participate in our coalitions and spaces to reach out because we're more than happy to have more and more people participating in the spaces. Uh, we launched this year, which seems really long time ago, a report on LGBTIQ populations in Afghanistan. And we have so many other things going along that it's hard to follow, but I do recommend everyone to checking out our website and everything that is coming out. If you're particularly interested in the UN, I'm more than happy to connect. If you're particularly interested in a lot of the other work that we're doing, we're also more than happy to put you in contact with colleagues. Thank you very much, Luisa, and you heard it. You can visit the website, you can learn about what is being done. There's tools, there's opportunities to connect, and uh, there's a lot of information there that uh, can be shared and, and in, you can access. Uh, Chamindra. Um, uh, thank you, Erica. So at Ilga World, um, a broad answer to that question there, would be the fact that uh, there's a lot of innovation happening at the minute um, in uh, some of the key areas of work of ILGA World. So, um, you know, ILGA has been known for the state-sponsored homophobia report and uh, also the trans legal mapping report. You know, one of some of our key uh, research outputs. Now, these research outputs have been um, united into um, one big research database. So uh, the database is going to be very diverse. It's going to include substantive sections on legal gender recognition, on um, uh, state-sponsored forms of homophobia. Uh, on um, uh, It's also going to have um, 
considerable coverage of intersex human rights issues. So um, there'll be a launch of the database happening during the World Conference, and it'll be a resource that uh, our communities worldwide can use uh, in, their, in their advocacy. And then in, when it comes to international advocacy, one of the key things that we do is uh, strengthening the position of um, trans, especially trans-led, trans-competent um, collectives worldwide with regards to, um, and, and providing them support with regards to um, uh, processes such as the universal periodic review and other engagements with treaty bodies and special procedures. So that's a body of work we're planning to, you know, really just strengthen and, um, and, and expand and build upon existing precedents. And then also uh, there is a other focus on strengthening our communities um, at the ground level and working towards um, increased um, uh, provision of support to, um, to, to trans and gender diverse communities, especially um, through our um, work on um, uh, mobilization against um, uh, this transnational anti-gender and anti-human rights uh, propagandist activities. So that's the body of work that's been developed um, uh, at the minute at ILGA as well. So, um, so it's, uh, there, there is a, there's a lot going on uh, in that sense uh, where uh, our communities will have uh, possibilities uh, of, of getting involved at different levels. Um, and, um, and I very much uh, warmly invite uh, you know, any, any representatives of uh, um, uh, trans and intersex led groups uh, watching this to get in touch if you would like any support with regards to engagement with uh, uh, special procedures and treaty bodies. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's, that's the uh, kind of um, uh, focus, like multi-pronged focus that we uh, try to develop as, a, as an organization. Over to you, Erica. Thank you, Chamindra. And I, and I later will come back to you to touch like really short about Trans Advocacy Week and what is happening in, for Trans Advocacy Week 2022 later. But I'm, I want to go to Levan first uh, before we come back to you. And, and I want to ask Levan to share about Gates, uh, you know, what is the foundation of Gates' vision and the strategy to address anti-gender backlash at the global level? And what will Gates be doing in the upcoming years uh, to support our communities? Yes, so um, I mean, Gate has um, several pillars of work, but um, a significant um, portion of our strategy is dedicated solely to anti gender uh, mobilizing and opposition against trans and gender diverse communities. And this strategy, this portion of strategy was heavily influenced by the amazing work that some of the activists did, the report that came out of their work. And they did a really amazing job in, in, in doing an extensive literature review, um, mapping anti-gender movements globally. They've had one-on-one -on -one consultations with key stakeholders, as well as, as far as I know, there were several workshops with the um, gate staff. And so the basic finding is what also the other panelists have been speaking about, and I don't want to go into a lot of details because they've covered it really well, but the basic finding that we also agree, at, I know our analysis also shows is that these groups are basically shaped and are also shaping um, broader geopolitical developments around the world, including the rise of authoritarian, right-wing populist, ultranationalist and conservative movements and actors, and the socio-cultural changes that these groups generate. Um, and these groups, we've seen that these groups have been, in certain contexts, being quite successful in not only rolling back some of the hard-won gains through in the past decades, but also shaping the environments in which trans and gender diverse groups and, and um, activists have to function. And the, the most alarming thing is that they've been able in certain contexts again, to dismantle some of the key conditions for change. So um, the attacks are like from coordinated attacks to um, certain civil society organizations to singling, singling out 
um, specific trans and gender diverse activists for harassment and the amount of the harm that they're doing is basically causing a lot of people to burn out and sometimes to even abandon their work. There's a lot of disinformation that is circling around which is also scaring or um, creating a lot of misunderstanding among um, allied groups, um, the feminist groups, and also some of the potentially um, supportive governments and institutions and on international level. So to address these issues, we have um, our ideally in, in the couple of years or in, in the upcoming years, what we would like to see is to have international institutions, first of all, acknowledge the human rights of trans people and at the same time um, improve the conditions or like contribute to improving the conditions where trans CSOs can function uh, in a more effective and more impactful ways. And um, I mean, some of the things that we would like to see is to have greater solidarity from allies. And for that, we hope to create certain opportunities where ally movements can show their support, whether it be some joint statements or joint campaigns um, and participation with um, each other's events. We're also going to have a lot of, hopefully a lot of discussions with um, organizations and movements from all different, um, um, all different, working on all different issues and all different um, types of problems, uh, to share our knowledge and share our concerns, and so that we're our work is coordinated and it, it reflects the needs of all the different uh, communities intersectionally. We want also to um, trans and gender diverse activists and communities to have better access to better quality information for which we'll be doing a lot of publications that national organizations can use for their advocacy efforts, as well as um, we are planning to do a report and some studies that will analyze what is the actual impact of this anti-gender groups of uh, on trans and gender diverse mobilizing around the world, what are the most pressing challenges and what they have been able to achieve. Um, and we also want to create opportunities for scholars and activists to create knowledge on these issues. So we'll have a series of webinars as well as publications on our webpage and we'll also also use maybe other um, platforms to um, basically enable activists from all around the world to share their experiences, what has worked, what has not worked, maybe some critical um, review and reflections on what has previously been done and what needs to be done that nobody has ever thought. So we, we want to create opportunities for knowledge and uh, critical knowledge and new ideas to be constantly shared among trans and gender diverse activities. Um, we also want to see power holders address anti-gender attacks. So that's why um, what Chaminder was saying, we'll also be going in a collaboration with ILGA, we'll also be approaching um, different organizations who want to participate in, uh, on an international level. But our focus in, in, in this work will be to work with them to highlight um, uh, anti-gender attacks and also create some joint recommendations that they can um, uh, have in their reports um, sent to international organizations. And finally, uh, we will um, be working with a lot of donors and uh, international organizations to serve as a bridge between local organizations and international organizations and donors to increase funding and other supportive mechanisms available for trans organizations. And we'll do a lot of, um, this year we will be doing a lot of um, capacity assessment of organizations all over the world. And hopefully next year when we will have more funding and more capacity, we'll start engaging in creating capacity, um, building activities tailored to the needs of these organizations where people can gather and can share experiences and can learn how to or increase their knowledge on how to campaign, how to write, I don't know, whatever they need in terms of their advocacy um, on international as well as national levels, whatever they needs will be, we'll try to, and mobilize all, all, the, all these resources and provide them. 
Thank you very much, Levan. I'm sure you're going to be extremely busy in the coming uh, months. Uh, and I'm sure that there's going to be ample opportunity to continue the collaboration with ILGA, with the ITF, and Outright. Um, we're quickly running out of time, but there's two questions. Um, one is it's a question that we can do a whole webinar about. So I'm gonna ask, Luisa, can you address it very concisely? And we're gonna remind uh, the, the, our listeners that we're gonna share a short report. And if the panelists consent, we're gonna have some contact information in those documents where you can make, you can, you will be able to contact directly different panelists and different organizations. So for Luisa, um, you, dis, you spoke about attacks from states and other actors. Can you speak a bit about how these actors are succeeding in closing down spaces at the UN level? And how can an organization, um, uh, support uh, and work around these areas, and it's particularly in issues around criminalization, for example. Yeah, you're right. This could be a full webinar, so I'm going to be very succinct and shallow, but we can have more conversations offline as well. Um, I think that there is a push in the same way that there's a push for anti-gender, for anti-civil society participation, because those things go together. The less you have civil society present, the less you have to talk about certain issues, the less you have to have some critical thinking, the less you have to address structural problems. Um, and COVID was used a lot to push back against that. So we continue in New York only having three passes per organization and considering that only 15 organizations around the globe have ECOSOC status, which means they can get a pass to enter the UN are LGBTIQ focused organizations. That means that we only have 45 people that can actually enter the building of the UN in New York, which also sends a really important message, right? I think it's important that we have conversations amongst ourselves on how organizations get this ECOSOC status, because this is another political space within the UN. And I think that when you're talking about issues like criminalization, it's really important to talk to organizations that are doing the work on the ground and those who are following this for a really long time when you want to do this work because each space is different, each language is different, the way people address things, uh, judicial systems and so on. So it's very important to see each case as a different case and working together with so many organizations that have been doing this since colonization to end uh, those criminalizing laws. Thank you very much, Luisa. And talking about UN spaces, Chamindra, very shortly, what can we expect for Trans Advocacy Week 2022? Um, thank you, Erica. So uh, Trans Advocacy Week, now this will be the seventh edition. Um, this time around, we uh, are operating uh, based on a, on a thematic uh, um, and our theme for this year is gender justice, peace and security. So we've been taking into account um, a lot of inconsistencies and challenges um, uh, that we face in the in, in the world today in terms of uh, inclusive uh, human rights provisioning when it comes to um, uh, gender justice. So um, Trans Advocacy Week will be held virtually uh, during the um, uh, June session of the Human Rights Council. And uh, there'll be opportunity for um, uh, all of you to take part through the public events, the um, side events at the Human Rights Council. And, uh, and also um, the, there was a process to select participants, which is now closed now. Um, uh, and and uh, thank you to everybody who, who applied and who will be part of uh, Trans Advocacy Week. Um, and also a uh, quick message to our um, uh, colleagues and partners in partner organizations um, um, worldwide. Uh, it's a, it's a, I mean, the UN as a space has always been very cis heteronormative. Uh, you know, there have been very strong class dimensions of you know, who gets to. Uh, go in, who gets to have space, who gets to wield power and so on and so forth. So um, this is also Trans Advocacy Week is very much a space where 
we challenge those realities uh, with regards to the UN. And um, it is in a way, I would say, uh, pretty much decolonial work that we are doing with regards to the, uh, with regards to the UN spaces by uh, bringing in uh, our communities and strengthening dialogues on gender, gender justice, uh, in, uh, inclusive gender justice work uh, uh, in UN spaces. So uh, that is the kind of thing you can expect. It's gonna be um, a, a, a strong, inclusive, holistic agenda for Trans Advocacy Week this time around. Over to you, Erica. Thank you, Chamindra. Uh, um, uh, Vivian, any closing remarks that you want to share? Words from the ITF on the topic. Yeah, I only wanted to appreciate like the, the space. It's so important for us to be mindful of how anti-gender politics has specific impacts on trans and gender diverse communities and movements, right? Like, and our needs for resources, our needs to be at spaces as well, right? Like demanding and being part of the uh, democratic efforts or about liberation, about um, justice. So, and I truly believe that uh, the ITF as other actors in this uh, philanthropic sphere have a responsibility um, to be constantly improving and planning, strategizing um, to really address those resourcing issues, right? Like, especially as Levan mentioned uh, more recently about those groups, movements and activists most marginalized. This is a constant struggle. This uh, presents many difficulties from financial transactions to be cleared to like uh, institutional limitations from movements. So yeah, I hope that everyone listening to this um, feels welcome to think together on how to respond to these elements. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, thank you for joining us. Levan, we are going to have a follow-up webinar in two days. Can you give us a little teaser? What will we have there? Yes, so the next webinar, which is going to be in two days, it's going to be a webinar where we will have representatives of organizations, regional organizations mostly, who will speak about anti-gender movements and the tactics and strategies that they use in their respective regions. So our viewers and our listeners will have an opportunity to see what are the similarities as well as differences on regional levels. Um, but in future, we're planning to also have more one region based conversations where um, activists from one region will, will discuss similar um, issues from their respective regions. So this year is going to be a lot of interesting webinars to, um, to watch and to follow. Thank you very much, Levan. And I really, really want to encourage you to uh, join us in two days. And also, uh, if you registered for this webinar, you will be receiving a synopsis of the conversations in the following weeks. Thank you very much, Luisa, Vivian, Chamindra, and Levan. Thank you for the ITF, ILGA World, and Outright for collaborating with us. And we look forward to much more collaborations in the future. Thank you for our viewers. Thank you for joining us, taking time to join us today. Have a great day.